So when we start the slides, I just... Uh, welcome, welcome everybody. I think um, people will arrive from lunch, but we have a small intimate crowd and I think uh, hopefully we have an audience online. So welcome to this session, uh, Vision for Restoration Monitoring, Transparency and Accountability Across Projects and Landscapes. And what we try to do today with this uh, incredible panel you see before you is to look at uh, challenges of monitoring restoration at different scales and how we can ensure transparency and accountability from projects to jurisdictions to countries and to global level reporting. So we have a series of presentations, um, really rich set of presentations for, for the way people are monitoring restoration at different scales. And, uh, and then we'll be followed by a moderated uh, discussion and an audience question and answer. So please, as we proceed, um, jump into Slido and, uh, and add your questions and then we will We'll bring them forward at the end, and um, there we go, and, uh, and we'll have a nice round of discussions. So without further ado, I will present our panellists um, in one big go, so bear with me. <laughs> we, have, uh, we have Gillian Gladstone. Gillian is a lead consultant at Climate Focus, where she provides advisory services to governments, multilaterals, private sector on sustainable land use, restoration, and nature-based solutions. Next, we have Elena Feingold. Elena is a forestry officer on the National Forest Monitoring Team of FAO, and she leads our work, I'll say our, because I'll introduce myself in a moment, <laughs> our work on restoration monitoring in support of the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration, including the framework on ecosystem restoration monitoring, which you'll see in a moment, and our, and our role in supporting the, the CBD on the Global Biodiversity Framework Target 2, which you'll hear about in a moment. Next, we have Rene, Rene Zamora, um, who's a senior manager on restoration policy um, for the Global Restoration Initiative at WRI. He directs the Secretariat of Initiative 2020, a regional initiative to protect and restore 50 million hectares of degraded and deforested land in Latin America by 2020 in support of the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. Next, we have Yves Katake Kimana. Thanks. Apologies, Eves, in advance. But uh, Eves is head of department uh, Earth Observation at Rwanda Space Agency with a PhD in remote sensing and geoinformation sciences from the Aerospace Information Research Institute at the Chinese Academy of Sciences. Welcome, Eves. Next, we have Mary Valley. Uh, Mary is, a land scales, is the Land Scales Technical Manager and primary expert on environmental, social, and governance and production impact ass assessment methodology. She leads the delivery and continuous improvement of land scales indicator framework, guidelines, assessment, and claims validation mechanism. Last but not least, we have Kevin Dalfirth. Kevin is a technical advisor for Wells for Zoe, an organization working to help people in rural Malawi access clean, safe drinking water. And as a technical advisor, Kevin has developed a monitoring, reporting, and verification framework for monitoring landscape restoration projects in Malawi. So thank you very much. We have an incredible panel that will talk about monitoring, transparency and accountability for restoration at different scales. And, uh, and I think I'll introduce myself now. So my name is Julian Fox. I'm, um, I lead a team in FAO that works on forest monitoring. And we also lead a task force on monitoring in support of the UN Decade. So I will provide the global context if we can I'll just click on this. Yes, there we go. So hopefully many of you have heard, but uh, the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration was, um, was proclaimed by the UN General Assembly uh, to run from 2021 to 2030 with really the global goal of halting the degradation of ecosystems and restoring them really as a contribution to sustainable development goals of the UN system. In 2021, we established five task forces to really catalyze and enable uh, the restoration movement. We, we created a monitoring task force, a best practices task force, finance, youth, and science task forces. 
in 2021, we were asked to lead the monitoring task force, and I'll, here we are, the task force on monitoring. So actually, right in the depths of lockdown, we, we launched our task force on monitoring, and maybe because everybody was sitting at their computers and weren't not able, allowed to leave the house, we quickly built a really nice partnership with, uh, with everybody that was interested in transparent restoration monitoring. Um, so now we're, now we're quite large and we've organised ourselves into sub-task forces. We have a terrestrial sub-task force that really looks at everything in the terrestrial ecosystem. And we have a sub-task force that looks at everything else. So everything that's aquatic, transitional ecosystems, freshwater, mangroves, peatlands. The first two are biophysical in nature and restoration is quite unique because people are central to restoration. So we, right from the start, we wanted to think about the socioeconomics of restoration. How much does it cost? Who, who gets the benefits? So we created a sub-task force on the socioeconomics. We also have a working group on drafting a methodology for reporting area under restoration, and this is in support to the CBD, which I'll talk about in a moment. So we have a, an incredible group of organisations. I think just about everybody is with us. And today's session was broadcast to the monitoring task force, and I hope many of them are with us on, online. But really, our, our collective... Um, Motivation is that sound monitoring can catalyze investments and really ensure science-based actions. You know, there's a lot of commitments on restoration, there's a lot of excitement about the possibility, but we need to do it in a, in a scientifically robust way, both in implementation and in monitoring and reporting. So as 2021, we commenced the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration, we created the Task Force on Monitoring, we worked with the task force uh, through lockdown, and in 2022, we launched the Framework for Ecosystem Restoration Monitoring, which I think Elena will present as sort of an umbrella uh, monitoring framework for the UN decade, really to capitalize on all the incredible innovation and all the other restoration monitoring platforms, some of which we've seen presented here um, in the last days. Target 2 was adopted at the end of last year. It was a really exciting moment. Target 2 to restore 30% of degraded ecosystems by 2030. So now we have this global level lighthouse that, uh, that the parties to the CBD agreed to and it's, uh, it's, a, it's a restoration lighthouse for the whole uh, restoration community. So here it is, um, headline indicator 2.0.1. Um, ensure that by 2030, at least 30% of areas of degraded terrestrial, inland water, and coastal and marine ecosystems are under effective restoration in order to enhance biodiversity and ecosystem functions and services, ecological integrity and connectivity. So you can see it's very ambitious and it's a bit complicated, but we really want to support um, parties and member countries to the CBD and all, and all countries to be able to have good data against this headline indicator. So with, with CBD, we created a, a little working group uh, last year when, when the target was under negotiation. And now we've created a little informal partnership, we call it the Target 2 partnership, really to try and bring together all the, all the capabilities that exist, um, some of which has been presented here in this, um, in this conference, to support countries in having really good data for, for restoration. These slides are quite detailed and, and we're gonna publish this um, in the coming days and I'll share it, but I'll, I'll go through this uh, reasonably quickly because I, I wanna give everybody a chance to talk. So one thing we need to do this year is to finalize the actual indicator. And this is, this, we need to do this in a way that allows countries to actually measure and report against this headline indicator. And we'll do this in consultation with, with expert, expert parties established by the CBD. But ultimately, we'd like to have the indicator um, with guidance finalised this year. Capacity development and awareness raising. I think, uh, you know, we've seen here at this conference the incredible possibilities of technology and innovation, but we really need to think about the people um, using the data. And in the opening session, the questions on equity and capacity development and technology transfer came through. And this, this is, I think, has to be central to everything we do to make sure that countries and uh, restoration stakeholders can, can measure and report their, their progress. So we have quite a bit of capacity development planned in the lead up to the next CBD COP, which is um, COP 16 at the end of next year. This is the data and the firm, and this is, uh, this is really interesting. I think Elena will present on this, but this is about bringing together through interoperability all the amazing data that's been collected on, on restoration in, in the many platforms that are that are running fast um, at the moment. 
So post COP16, uh, the end of next year, it's a really critical moment these two years for the countries because they need to update their restoration commitments. They need to put in their, yeah, basically report their commitments to the CBD and then, and then after COP16, re start reporting progress against those commitments. So exactly, and uh, one reason we did this was to really harmonise reporting for progress under the UN decade uh, through the monitoring task force with monitoring and reporting to the CBD. So NBSAPs, as I said, national biodiversity action plans need to be submitted uh, quite quickly and countries need a lot of support to, to have good targets and then set up systems to monitor and report against those targets. For the UN decade, we have a report um, the Secretary General will deliver on the progress of the decade, which will be very, very nicely aligned to the CBD reporting. So without further ado, that is the global level picture. And you can see we have this incredible lighthouse at 2030 to restore 30% of degraded ecosystems. And now I think uh, we, we move to the experts to see all the different possibilities. And first, um, straight to Gillian Gladstone. Uh, Gillian, please. Thank you so much, Julian. Really nice to be here. Really nice to see you all. And um, excited to tell a little bit or talk a little bit about the um, a, a small piece, maybe, of that puzzle of initiatives um, promoting uh, restoration monitoring um, in use. So um, I'm going to talk about uh, a restoration monitoring tools guide that Climate Focus um, and World Resources Institute, WRI, put together and launched earlier this year. Um, before I do that, maybe just briefly um, introduce sort of my role here. So uh, I uh, represent Climate Focus, but also uh, coordinate a network of organizations, the Global Restoration Observatory, through which we had a lot of input and uh, who, so you know, a number of organizations contributed to development of this tools guide. So um, first off, what are we? What was the aim here? So um, what we had heard for a number of years, working on um, supporting the development of improved restoration monitoring, um, was that there is a lot of um, tools, a lot of initiatives, a lot of um, you know resources available to help folks who are doing monitoring on the ground, but it was a bit hard to wade through it all to figure out what's out there and how to use it. So um, we uh, undertook together, uh, so with WRI, an effort to um, understand the components, lay out the components of an effective monitoring system, highlight the variety of tools available on offer to support uh, practitioners and monitors, and then actually um, provide examples of monitoring in action. Um, this built, again, like I said, on the um, contributions of a lot of the members of the GROW network, but particularly on work that had been done um, by the folks at FAO um, and through the monitoring task force to first map a whole um, host of uh, monitoring tools available. And then with the input and consultation from the organizations whose um, names you see here. Um, so we first started laying out uh, the critical steps or components of a restoration monitoring system. So starting with defining the area of interest, um, setting a clear and consistent set of indicators, establishing a baseline, um, identifying a source of uh, transparent, sustainable, reproducible data, and then identifying a reporting mechanism. And so what we aim to do in this tool finder that we launched was provide sort of a pathway or a, a, a tree you know, branching structure that would take you through the process of those five steps, allow you to uh, select what part of the monitoring um, effort or component you're working on, and then identify tools that can be used to help you meet your monitoring needs. Um, and so we've launched this in a tools guide. It's available online. I invite you to come, um, you know, 
play around with it, take a look, um, figure out if there are some tools that can suit your needs. But there are also a few other things we do here. Um, so like I said, examples of sort of restoration in action, taking a look at how um, organizations and practitioners have actually established their monitoring programs, um, what kinds of tools they're using, and um, uh, you know, even some of the kind of challenges that they are aiming to address with the use of these individual tools. Um, and then, um, you know, allowing someone to actually go through that process, check off what they're trying to do, what they, what kind of inputs they already have, what language they're working on, what kind of data they have, and allow you to play around and figure out what kinds of tools best meet your needs. Um, so again, please uh, feel free to check out the guide and happy to talk more about um, the broader, you know, the place this fits in the monitoring um, ecosystem. Thank you, Jillian and Julian. Um, really great to hear about the, um, the tools guide and the UN decade. Now I'm going to um, speak about a few of the tools that we have at FAO uh, that we're developing to monitor and report on uh, progress on the UN decade. Uh, I'm Yelena Feingold. I'm uh, on, on Julian's team uh, leading the work on restoration monitoring. And let me get started. So first, what is the global status on restoration? It's a, it's a big question. Um, and what we do know is that country, oops. How do I go back? Okay, thank you. <laughs> there we go. Um, so we, what we do know is that countries have uh, committed upwards of a billion hectares of land uh, to restore, um, but we need to monitor the, the restoration activities and the actions. How are countries actually res restoring? Are they, they meeting their restoration commitments that they've set? Um, so the, the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration um, hopes to help answer that question by bringing together this community and by uh, supporting the Convention on Biological Diversity and helping uh, countries that are parties to uh, the CBD to report on areas under restoration and the target that um, Julian presented. So to tackle this question of global restoration progress, We've been working to develop the framework for ecosystem restoration monitoring, um, or FIRM, as we call it for short. Um, the FIRM, it aims to facilitate collaboration and transparent monitoring and reporting, and to access the latest information, um, data, and technology to enable people, communities, and countries to produce their own restoration information, to see what is available out there, and to monitor their own progress. Um, and we're developing guidance with partners to put the pieces of this restoration puzzle together. Uh, and we know that there are already many frameworks, mechanisms, tools, and partners that are collecting data on restoration, and we would like these to, to speak to each other so we can all put our efforts together um, under a common interoperable framework. And so to monitor restoration, there's no one solution. And so what Jillian presented is really key. This, uh, this tool guide that helps you uh, select relevant tools for monitoring restoration based on the type of restoration, um, the scale, the ecosystem that is being restored, uh, the stage of the activities, and so we aim to elevate these operational solutions um, and monitor restoration. Um, and that data should be um, open and easily accessible. And, um, and so we aim to put all of this information out there through, um, through the firm. 
and into a public searchable database where you can see um, what platforms are out there that are sharing information on restoration, what type of data that they're collecting, and an aggregate information on all of, um, from all of those platforms to get an idea of what the global restoration progress is and to also assist countries to um, report on target two of the global biodiversity framework. So um, that was kind of firm, a bit conceptually, and more tangibly, we, we actually have a website. Um, it is firm.fao.org, and, um, and what it consists of is a, a registry where uh, restoration initiatives can go in and enter their information there. Um, and also enter information on good practices that can then be shared through the UN decade. Um, and, 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 and then the, those um, initiatives are reviewed by, um, by the review board <laughs> of the, the best practice task force and initiatives and best pra good practices for restoration are then displayed on, on the firm platform. And we're also working on a good practice search engine that already operationalizes some of this interoperability work that takes data from WOCAT, Panorama Solutions, GoPro 4, and the data that's collected in the firm and puts it in a common database where anyone can search for restoration good practices and have access to them. And, um, and collaboration is really key there. We know that through the firm, we're not going to be able to collect all information on areas under restoration. And so we have some um, really key partners, and I'm really happy to see some of those partners here um, this week and in this room, uh, such as AFR 100, Initiative 2020, um, TerraMatch, Restore. And it's key that we work together, that our platforms speak, and that we can put our data together to um, assist countries with reporting and be transparent with the amount of restoration that's going on and, yeah, and, and help each other. So in FAO, um, also kind of looked internally and um, are working towards getting better geospatial information for restoration projects um, at FAO, um, Jeff projects, and um, we're working on um, operationalizing the firm registry also for Jeff project monitoring. And then I would like to give a, a brief overview of then some of the broader tools that we have at FAO for restoration planning, monitoring, and reporting. Um, that includes uh, C-Plan, which is a tool for identifying areas, um, potential areas for restoration. It's a decision support tool um, that does some multi-criteria analysis and cost-benefit analysis and allows the use of custom layers. Um, Aurora, which was developed with WRI to help identify indicators for monitoring restoration in the planning phase. Um, and then, of course, the restoration needs to happen on the ground, and then subsequently it can be uh, monitored. And that can be done in the field, um, really important, especially in the first stages of restoration. Um, and there is Collect Mobile for field inventories. We're also working with Google to develop um, an easy-to-use tool for um, field data collection called Ground. And then from the sky as well, so using remote sensing, uh, we have Sepal that um, empowers anyone to use and create their own maps. Um, and many countries are using this to monitor um, land land change dynamics, um, and collect earth for collecting reference data or sample-based um, data using uh, satellite imagery, and lastly, the firm, which I just presented on. So I think my time is up, and I would like to thank you for your attention, and I will pass it to the next presenter.
I'm just going to continue, and Angelina already mentioned about Aurora. Uh, Aurora is a system that we, um, basically we started with a, with a report that is called the Road to Restoration that we did together with FAO. And the idea was, you know, how, what are the steps you need to follow in order to monitor, no? So then we came up with, uh, with Aurora. We work it with a lot of countries uh, in general, and, and one of the key questions of, of the countries is how we monitor, no? But the challenge is you cannot monitor if you don't have objectives first. And then if you don't have objectives first, then you cannot monitor. So it's a, <coughs> it's a sequence of steps <coughs> that, that we need to follow in order to uh, be able to design a monitoring framework. And that's what Aurora is. Aurora is online. It's Aurora, that, uh, Aurora monitoring that org, and we will share the, the address for those who uh, have not seen the tool. Um, it's a tool that is very light. It's in um, right now. Uh, the way it works is in in the browser. So you open in Google Chrome or, or Mozilla, and basically you start a project in that. And the first question that you are being asked there is about the objective. No, what are your objectives? No, what is energy? It's uh, about uh, biodiversity uh, because there are many. No, in restoration. And there are the, the countries see restoration in a different way, you know. For example, in Uruguay, that we work also, they, they, they want to restore soil more than, than really forests, you no? Know? It's grasslands, natural grasslands. Um, in the case of Chile, it's, it's pretty much forest restoration. So the indicators change. So that's what we have here. And basically, you know, with, with all of these um, work that we have been doing, we also develop a, a sustainability index for landscape restoration. Um, the idea of that, and I will share it in another slide later, was uh, how we can aggregate different indicators in a single metric, no? But uh, Aurora itself, the process is very easy, as I was saying. You start with, what, first, you know, what are your land uses? What are your barriers? Uh, what are your goals? And once you have your goals, you have your indicators. The once you have your indicators, you need to identify the constraints of the indicators, and then you have the monitoring framework. Let's do an example. For example, if it's biomass, no biomass, we want to increase biomass in, a, in an area from 100 uh, tons per hectare to a 300 tons uh, per hectare. No? You need to have a, a, a baseline and a target. That's the key in Aurora. You need to have the indicator. And before you choose the indicator, you also need to think what is the quality of the indicator. Because, you know, when, especially when you are experts in, in certain areas, uh, they want the best indicator, no? Organic uh, carbon on, on soil. But who is collecting that? Uh, do we have the resources to collect that in, in periods, no? Because we can have the money now, but not tomorrow, and then we cannot monitor, no? So it's just those things that makes you reflect on what indicators you can use, but being pragmatic in a way that uh, not all indicators you choose are uh, real, no? Uh, or you can implement it for real. Um, this is just the framework, how, how it works. And at the end, Aurora allows you to do an index. The index pretty much works like, a, you know, when you are sick and um, you go to the doctor, no? Um, they do some tests, no? They do some indicators, no? And they check your blood, for example. And your blood is showing that you have high sugar levels. That is a signal or something, but it's not uh, the disease, no? You have something else, no? So that's basically the idea of the index. Let's aggregate different indicators in a single metric so we can report for a landscape, for example. And that's uh, what, what you can do in, the, in Aurora, too. Um, the index itself, uh, this is a real world application. El Salvador developed their own index. Uh, basically, they, they decided on indicators, and then they create the metric. Um, this is how it works. This is the landscape. It's uh, an area close to the uh, Pacific Ocean um, and the mountains in the, uh, the volcano where they plant the coffee. And we have uh, these indicators that you see there, six of them, water quality, landscape biodiversity, carbon equivalent index, uh, uh, jobs, but we didn't call it jobs because there are temporary jobs and there are permanent jobs because in restoration, you need a lot of labor probably in the first year, second year, but that's temporal. And if you add those as jobs, then you are misleading the, the, the metric, no? So we separate that instead of putting jobs permanent or, or temporal, 
in El Salvador, we calculate hours. Um, vulnerability reduction that you see there, and one that we developed that was very interesting for me is the governance one. The governance is not especially explicit, it's more about focus groups in the landscapes we work, where you ask people, you have a common vision, you have policies, you have all those things. El Salvador, for some reason, which I don't like, but uh, they, they prefer to move from zero to one, being one, achieving all the targets. For me, it's more like 100, it, it means more meaningful because then you use decimals, but that's fine. Um, and they have 0 0.39 of achievement based on the goals that they have. Right now, they are a little bit further uh, for that landscape, but still having achieved the goals. So the key here is showing the people, you know, you are 0 0.39, but then if you wanna see where that number comes from, like the blood test that I was using as an example, then you need to go to the scorecard or the indicators, no? Uh, the beauty of the method is that you can use it for uh, everything and you, you select the indicators that apply to your landscape. Here is, is El Salvador. We, we supported one in Brazil and the indicators are different, but you see the, the logic here. So that's the other tool that, uh, that is there. And I want to stop there and then give that to Yves, right? Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, WRF, for extending an uh, invitation to Rwanda Space Agency. Uh, I was asking myself, what am I going to, to speak after this system? Uh, because the many system for monitoring, for evaluation and what. But uh, my answer, I got it, it's in your hub, which I'm going to present. Um, I want to take you at least to give you uh, a background of who we are, Rwanda Space Agency. Uh, our vision uh, is to develop global uh, competitive space and um, our mission is to to develop Rwanda space sector toward the social economic development using space technology and space service and the product development. And I think that's here in this narrative or mission, that's the way we fit. So um, I'm going to spend much more of my time on this Johab because uh, as we know, this uh, theme of this conference is data and impact. But uh, to have data, quality data, uh, you, you, you need to have infrastructure, but also to have impact, you need someone to understand data because you need to build this gap. And that's why I think GeoHub comes in because uh, assume you have everything under one room, and one roof, uh, you have analytics, you have the data storage, you have application, you have uh, uh, academia, you have any resources you think of. So then, uh, after having everything, after um, having, let's say, a high-performance computer, you need to, to perform um, a complex model. Uh, you need to have a geospatial data, database ready to use API and connect to every uh, information around. So this gives uh, a power to use because uh, you can have impact directive. Let me give you an example. Um, if you are planning to, to do restoration and you don't know where you are going to have this impact of restoration of forest, and assume you are uh, logging to this geo hub, you have uh, maps where um, it gives you like where there is less impact of vegetation. So then you need to have data instead of moving to one ministry to another agency, but you have everything and one under one roof. That's the idea of GeoHub. Um, so in terms of potential earth observation, uh, when we are using forest monitoring, we, we have high visit time, we have uh, wide uh, spatial covering, we have uh, cost effectiveness because uh, one thing is government institution and it's government uh, uh, investment. You don't need to pay any, any single penny to, to get uh, uh, satellite images, I'm talking about commercial ones, Maxar, Planet, and so forth. So another one in terms of remote sensing, uh, where you can have um, already uh, model 
to, to, to do some change detection, to do forestry, to do uh, carbon sequestration, you do even landslide. So, and um, I, I want to demonstrate the power of what I'm talking about because uh, this is uh, crucial because after having data, so you, you need to have those, uh, to answering those questions which is driving impact. So, and um, one thing of application we're talking about here, it's uh, what we call smart agriculture. Uh, this one, you are trying to see how this fun functionality, the, your right side, where you, depends where you are. I think you can see the crop type, you can see a crop vegetation, you can see field boundaries. And this is also to contribute to, to the forest because it's agroforest you are talking about. And because our country is hilly, you can have, if you don't monitoring, monitor um, landslide or flood, this, it gives you impact or it gives you the like, um, um, ability to know where uh, your impact are and your efforts are. So, and to your left, you, you can see like uh, urbanization. Uh, that's why you have footprint, uh, building, and to see uh, the impact of this uh, application monitoring using GeoHub because you have everything uh, at, uh, at your disposal. So another one which is interesting, it's a uh, uh, landslide because uh, vegetation and this impact of uh, restoration, one minute you are, you are doing restoration, another one, uh, a landslide comes in and destroying your efforts. And because within time you need to monitor this, because while mapping, you know where efforts are needed much to 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 fight this landslide or to to reduce the landslide. You need to reduce land cover, which is like a slope, and you need to put forests to to have retention of water and uh, everything. And we have been able to map uh, the entire country and where to have like um, mapped like area susceptible to floods in Rwanda. So that's uh, in terms of restoration, that's why folks there need to know to, to put much effort in those area because it's easy to see and easy to, to manage. Uh, in terms of monitoring forestry, where we are having, we can use uh, remote sensing and machine learning to, to know where uh, forestry or just uh, illegal mining or just uh, deforestation is happening using different bands. And um, to the right one, you can see change detection uh, in the forest because uh, you're having this power to, 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 to do so. Um, I think that's what I, um, thank you for your time and merci. Thank you very much. So following this excellent presentation, I'm going to um, talk about a monitoring approach that is very complementary to the global monitoring of international commitments, but also very complementary to the project level monitoring. And I'm going to talk in particular, so I'm going to talk about landscape level monitoring and in particular about a tool called Landscale that is laid, led by the Rainforest Alliance and Conservation International. And before starting, just a few words about landscape level monitoring. It's really about breaking the silos between the different projects and different activities happening at a landscape level and understanding the combined impact of these different activities and projects. And landscape monitoring and more broadly landscape approaches are also about breaking the silos between the different stakeholders uh, operating within a landscape. So now let's see how the Landscale tool um, contributes to that. Um, Landscale uh, provides outcome level insights through th uh, three key components. The first component is our assessment framework. It's an holistic framework. It's a list of indicators and metrics uh, that a stakeholder within a landscape can use to assess the sustainability within their landscape. 
Then the second component is a validation mechanism uh, provided both by the Landscale team itself and also by local experts within the landscapes. And the third component is a platform, an online platform that walks the users um, through the workflow and allows them also to share the results of their assessments. And um, we are currently developing additional um, interactive dashboards for users to showcase the results of their assessments, as well as a claims mechanism for users to be able to uh, communi communicate about their contribution to the landscapes. And uh, this comes with um, an additional validation mechanism uh, around uh, claims. To zoom in a little bit on our assessment framework, so the first component that I showed on the former slide, um, we have four pillars. One pillar on ecosystems, everything related to conservation and restoration of biodiversity, uh, natural ecosystems and uh, ecosystem services. We have a pillar on human well-being, uh, including livelihoods, uh, including topics last, like health and nutrition, education, um, and also focusing on human uh, rights, including um, the uh, child labor, women's rights, and the rights uh, of indigenous peoples and, and other marginalized groups. Our third pillar is about governance. It's about land tenure, land conflicts, resource tenure, and also about uh, transparency, participation, and inclusion and coordination in landscape policy planning and management. And our fourth and last pillar is around production and the sustainable practices in place in the different production system in place in the landscape. And I'm not gonna go too deep into uh, the details of this framework uh, for the sake of time, but we'll be uh, at the marketplace in a bit less than one hour. So if you're interested, just stop by and I'll be happy to show you or to share the link um, with you. One last thing I want to say about that framework though is that it's super flexible. So users are free to just drop topics that are not relevant to their landscape or to add their own indicators um, to that. How it works in practice. It all starts with one stakeholder in the landscape thinking that it would be a good idea to, um, to, to do an assessment of the landscape, whether it's a baseline assessment or a repeated assessment after some activities have taken place. That stakeholder, step one, builds um, a, an assessment team. Step two, that assessment team defines the boundary of the landscape. Step three, that team goes through the framework that I, I just showed and selects the indicators and metrics that make sense, that are relevant for their landscape. Step four, they source the data um, and they analyze the, da the data to, to fill these metrics. And step five is about the reporting with a lot of that being auto automated through the platform. Um, after each of these steps, we have a validation by Landscale team. And in addition to that, after step four, uh, there is a, a, a mandatory validation by local experts from the landscape. Our platform has been launched in April 2022, and um, now, now it's more than uh, 20 users already uh, that are using it, covering uh, more than 20 uh, million hectares. And we, fit, we featured five examples here on the map just to mention that there is a variety of users from NGOs to donors to private sector to uh, project implementers, including in the carbon sector, and uh, in a variety of countries and um, in a variety of contexts also, very different landscapes. Now, how do we know if landscape level monitoring is the, a relevant approach in a given place? It's a relevant approach if you want to understand sustainability at the landscape scale in a holistic way to break down the silos, as I, I was saying in the beginning. It's the relevant approach if you want to monitor sustainability outcomes uh, consistently and reliably. So that's what's uh, brought by the, the landscape framework. Uh, you also need to have access to local knowledge and landscape stakeholders. That's a very key point in landscape level monitoring and really core to uh, landscape methodology. 
And it's also important to be able to invest human resources in conducting the assessment, because as we all know, monitoring takes time and it takes money. And also in terms of the relevance of the scale, um, ideally the landscape would be large enough to capture linkage, linkages between different sustainability issues, but small enough for results uh, to inform interventions. And that's it. So these are the, the, this is the link where you can uh, find the land scale uh, tool and the land scale platform. And this is also uh, just to mention that we developed a grant proposal toolkit because we know that uh, monitoring takes resources. So we thought that uh, for some of you who are operating uh, through grants, that would be a very convenient tool to have such a kit to integrate directly in your proposals. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. If you were to visit the shop of Wells for Soy, you could donate a village well with a soy pump, and the staff in Malawi would uh, produce it, install it in your name, for example, and then take photos of the installation. After some time, you'd receive an email, um, which would not contain a regular certificate, but it would contain basically a link to your pump on the map. Um, and by giving you the information, you would then have the ability to literally visit your own pump. It's a great excuse to go to a trip, which is kind of how this all started for me. Um, as well as Soy has installed more than 2,300 NGPS uh, map pumps, the idea of a pump map was always to bring the transparency in the charity world to a new level. And as this worked quite well for pumps, we wanted to replicate this methodology for the land restoration and indigenous tree planting projects. So now we have uh, several thousand GPS photos, drone panoramas, and drone map layers on the map as planting proof, and to also show, of course, that the work has been implemented. And using all sorts of GPS photo apps, we were actually really annoyed by how complicated it was to share large amounts of GPS photos for inexperienced users and created Flority. It's a GPS photo app that makes it really easy um, to share these files, as basically you don't need to share those files as they're just automatically uploading. That is really the idea here. And yeah, we're currently develop developing a proper backend for this. And uh, yeah, in many areas throughout Malawi, erosion um, through deforestation and overgrazing is a really big problem and it uh, poses a significant threat to farmlands. And in order to restore these, there are different methods and planting trim uh, trees only um, cannot be the only solution as they simply won't grow. And so there are different methods that we can use. So for example, contour berms are, are established on slopes. So for example, if you have a slope going downhill, you would dig a contour berm every 10 meters, like half a meter deep, 40, 50 centimeters wide, and substantial amounts of, of soil would entrap there. Then also stick fences are installed in gully systems. And also there is the same idea applies that's sand, soil, and most especially topsoil, which is nutrient rich and has some seeds, will be trapped there. Um, a great um, yeah, soil as well to plant indigenous tree seedlings then. And then to cover barren ground, it's really effective to just spread out grasses that you harvest before and the grass seeds will then establish um, a great precursor for forest. Um, also, um, a book with practical guidance on soil erosion control practices, practices has been uh, published by Conservation Management Services, which support us there in, in the training. Um, yes, and using drones, we can create digital, um, um, digital 3D models, basically digital copies of the landscape, um, which allows to, to go really in depth. For example, here we see one animation with an altitude layer or layered on top, and we see the red line is basically one digital contour, and we see behind that the different small contour berms are actually not really following the contour. So then we can go back and we can tell the team, hey guys, listen, we see on the map that it's not perfectly implemented, so you have to go back, you have to revisit the site, and you have to install stick fences, you have to redig those contours and make sure that they actually work the intended way, as otherwise all the seeds, all the seedlings that are planted, all the work might be completely worthless um, when the rains start, because then it might just all wash away. So this is really, really helpful. Um, yeah, 
How many planting holes do you see in this photo? And would you rather trust? I forgot the math about it. <laughs> would you rather trust 100 people counting to 10,000, or would you trust one person to count to 1 million? Like, that's actually the reality on the ground that you have. Um, because, of course, you have all these people planting those trees, and then you get the number back. Like, yeah, today we planted 724 trees in this area. And you're like, yeah, may maybe you did. And so to kind of check up on these things, we use high-resolution um, high drone mapping, um, supported by Wingtra and Pix4D. And then, obviously, we can do these trials in, in Pictera and be like, hey, let's use machine learning, artificial intelligence to actually check up on those claims if this has actually happened. Um, but also, we, we add um, panoramas into the mix of this, this monitoring experience that you can actually just go to, go to the site, click on the panorama, look around, zoom in, be like, are there actually ceilings on the ground or are the, the planting holes actually um, implemented? Um, yeah, let's uh, take a last look on our map, which is kind of the, the foundation. So here is the base layer on Google Earth at the maximum zoom level. And then if we zoom in, and as we are not really keen on only self-reported data, we can overlay clusters and photos and drone map layers, um, which is really great to give an experience kind of what it is. Um, or how the situation is on the ground. And now having these high resolution images, um, you can really um, zoom in very well and overlay different layers. So for example, like here's a, um, a new layer from the rainy season, that's why it's green, but it's, it's, it's like the greenness is not the result of the, of the work, but just the change of the season. Um, now zooming in, we can actually really go, go as far as to see individual seedlings. Um, and this is like, uh, like only a few months after planting them. Um, yeah, to, to basically uh, finish my talk here, um, this is an experience of like basically clicking through, th clicking through the map and looking at the same site from different angles and different um, times. Yes, then uh, as this is not the only thing Welsh Resort is doing, um, we're fo obviously focused on, um, on landscape restoration right now, but this is all started with the, with the installation of pumps. And then we have different projects to empower women, so that is education. We support 300 uh, girl child students at secondary school. We also support 300 tree planting clubs, which kind of evolved around uh, self-help groups, so there are mostly women there. Um, and then, as it's called, the vision for restoration monitoring, our vision is to integrate this map that you have seen into a, a new backend where we have more user control, where we, have, where we can refine some features and where it will be truly unlimited scaling because we're running into, into some bottlenecks every now and then, like, ah, oh, you only have a 50 gigabyte drone layer and not a 100 gigabyte drone layer that you can actually uh, implement into the map, for example, on Google. Yeah, I'm Kevin from Wales for Soy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, sorry, that was a bit of a uh, powerful set of presentations, so thanks for bearing with us. So we actually have a very active online audience as well, which is wonderful, and there's a lot of questions coming in on the Slido, so please um, ask questions, and uh, I'll... I'll quickly start um, with a round of questions to the panelists. A, a question that's popped up a few times is, um, is really around what is, the, what is the most significant challenge that you see? So there's some questions are appearing here, but um, what is really the most significant challenge? We've heard all different scales um, and maybe some, some, some of your ideas as, as people in a monitoring restoration on, on how we can address those. So maybe we start uh, with Gillian and then move over. So really, what is the one or two key challenge in monitoring restoration? And any solutions would be, would be really great. Is this? Yes, OK. Um, yeah, I think um, from my point of view, a couple, a couple thoughts, and just reflecting even listening to these great presentations, is that we know there's a lot of um, resources available. There are a lot of ways that people can go in and start to actually um, do, you know, monitoring on the ground, using their phone, collecting data, looking, you know, different layers of data. Um, and I think that, you know, that, as I mentioned uh, in my 
presentation, that was one of the motivations for um, creating the tools guide was to help provide some sort of a, a way of organizing these. But then just broader, I know this is something that you all um, with the task force have been really focused on is thinking about how to coordinate and, and help create, you know, identify areas for collaboration, um, even thinking, you know, one step further in the tools guide that we launched was if we could actually create, um, create like schemes for how you could integrate a series of tools. So from start to finish, you start here, export data into here, analyze it, you know, do your monitoring like in some kind of continuous chain. And we're not there yet, but I think something like that would be really helpful to continue to try to um, create more guidance for those doing this work. Yeah, thank you. And yeah, I, I, I love that idea, Jillian. Um, and would love to work with uh, with the people on this panel on that. Um, yeah, I'm happy to facilitate that through the the UN Decade Task Force on Monitoring. Um, I think from from kind of the the global perspective um, and assisting towards uh, monitoring on the global biodiversity framework. Um, I think one of a, a challenge is how to integrate restoration uh, monitoring into national monitoring systems, and how countries can um, can coordinate with with different ministries um, and and report on on national progress. Um, it's it's easy for politicians to to make those commitments. But then to to um, implement those activities and monitor them and ensure that there is uh, effective restoration, I think is um, well is an ongoing challenge. Um, in terms of some of the work that that we'll be doing, um, we'll be collaborating with um, with CBD, um, doing capacity um, development with CBD national focal points. Um, to provide um, an overview of data that's out there in terms of areas under restoration and, and tools that they can use and integrate into their national monitoring systems um, to, to enhance the, the data that's available. And, and it's important then that, um, that different tools speak together, like, like you said, Julian, that we have open data, that it's transparent, and then it's um, accessible. So, and, and then that countries um, have ownership of that data um, so they can report on it. I fully agree here. And really coming from the, the small, small, small scale level, basically, that we are really like on the ground. Um, I think as well that um, if the education in, in these aspects and the training could be improved, for example, now in talking about specifically Malawi, because um, for example, we have three drone pilots in our team, two are male, one is female, and all three are the only three drone pilots north of Lilongwe, like north of the capital. These are the only three. We know that because everybody has to register there. So. Um, and there are possibly 100 more organizations working in this space, so there's nobody having an official drone pilot, for example, and the drone data unlocks so many different things. So, um, yeah, so I would say education in, in, in this specific, um, like, range of activities, be it how do I collect a, a GPS polygon of a planting site properly, um, to how do I fly a drone and assess the data, like this is really like, which is kind of fundamentals because we're always talking about like frameworks and 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 whatnot. But then like the the super basics are quite difficult to implement in some areas of the world. Thank you. Thank you. So for me, I will answer this through the lens of uh, government agency because that's what I'm representing now. So I think number one, it's la lack of ra wrong term monitoring. Because each project comes in and let's say like it has a span of two years, three years, and stopped. And there is no way data is being corrected. There is uh, no procedure of recording those data from 
because they are getting from project. And another one is data continuity. Because uh, assume like 10 years, someone can ask like, our country, Rwanda has pledged to, to have like 1 million hectare to, to be restored. But I think if you ask anyone how far we are and how much we are uh, during this uh, 1 million, I think there is no specific answer because every project is in a, no, no connection of each project. And I think that's number one. Number two is uh, we need to put uh, data sharing uh, in terms of projects, data sharing uh, uh, policies and framework. So at least because what everything we are doing can have alignment to collectively as a country. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to be build on what Julian was saying and what Eve was saying, uh, actually, because I think that to Julian's, to Julian's, Julian's point uh, on uh, the wealth of tools that are out there and can be very o overwhelming, I think we, we can say the same also for the data sets. Uh, and I think that's uh, two sides of the same coin. And events like this one are super helpful into um, socializing the, the wealth of data sets that are available or will be soon available. But how do we bring that knowledge out there for uh, people in the countries, in the landscapes? That's another challenge. And on the contrary, on some topics, um, there is a lack of data, uh, the data availability, as he was mentioning, um, on topics like everything related to social aspects and also to some extent to governance. In a, lot, in a lot of cases, users trying to monitor restoration at landscape level do not have access to secondary data on these topics and therefore they need to do the effort to collect data themselves. So one thing that we could do when it comes to solutions is also, and it goes back to the, the, the guide uh, to developing uh, guidelines on how to use tools, is to centralize and standardize methodologies and tools to actually collect primary data on social aspects and governance aspects um, and making sure that users collecting data can also share with the other users so that others do not have to repeat the data collection. And the, the third and last point that is linked to these two is that it costs money to collect data and all these activities of data collection should be written in the action plans in the project developments upfront because these are um, really part of the activities that should be uh, conducted within the project if we want that monitoring to be successful and done in a way where it's possible to actually connect the dif different scale of monitoring. Thank you. Yeah, just uh, really to complement because many things have been said, but one of the things that we see at the national level because there are different scales of monitoring, but it's governance. Because restoration is cross-sectional, no? It's agriculture, it's forestry, it's many other things and institutions at the government works in in sectors no Agri agriculture works in agriculture forestry works in forestry and the legal mandate of the organization uh, mandates to go in that so for example forests won't measure agricultural lands because it's not a legal mandate and then they get into the other institutions no so what we're seeing as a potential solution probably is a common reporting Maybe they can share the same unit to report, but they don't have to have a unified monitoring system. And the, the second one is the causality versus uh, correlation. No? At the landscape in national level, you, you can claim that restoration is contributing, but, it, but it's correlation really. No? Um, we don't, I mean, at project level, if you plant the tree, you can measure the carbon of that tree, and that's cause effect, no? causality, but at the at the landscape at national level, it's a correlation of factors that are not uh, entirely related to restoration only. There are uh, economy, other variables that were mentioned here. Thank you. 
That was really great. I, um, yeah, I, I think uh, there, was, there was quite a bit of agreement, but it was really interesting hearing the different challenges for people monitoring restoration at different scales. I mean, clearly, I think at the government level, there's that, always that challenge of sustainability, right? How do you sustain, sustain this over time in your institutions um, so it's not, it doesn't come and then go away and always yeah, cross-sectoral coordination because res restoration is cross-cutting. It should, uh, it should involve all the, all the ministries of, of a government. And yeah, I, I really appreciated the, the themes on we need to be interoperable, we need to collaborate, and that's why I think events like this are, are so good that we speak together. And that, you know, there's so much innovation. Even in this room, there's people that have incredible platforms. And, there, and some of the questions are sort of saying also, it feels like there's too many tools in this space, but I actually don't really agree with that. I think we should encourage um, we should encourage more innovation. And the main thing that we need to ensure is that um, that there's some level of interoperability. So there's some level of collaboration. We that's really critical, particularly from my perspective of of having some responsibility to do global reporting. We really want to make sure we can bring together all the incredible data that's been collected in different platforms. And, and provide a really transparent report on the progress, um, which is really critical at the moment. Yeah, and data sharing, completely agree. So there's, there's been um, quite a few quite specific questions in the, in the Slido, so keep them coming. I, um, one interesting thing that's come up is, is uh, how we link um, restoration monitoring at different scales. So we, we heard a really wonderful example of a, of a project, how we can, how we can make sure we link the, the, the small-scale restoration monitoring to the, to the national and then to the global reporting. I mean, it's not easy, but maybe we do that through interoperability, but I'd love to, I'd love to hear a word from each panelist on, on their ideas on, uh, on that. If, if you have an idea, please. <laughs> Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so I well, first of all, restoration, it, it happens on the ground. So the project level monitoring is essential. Um, and we need tools that uh, enable restoration practitioners to uh, monitor their restoration activities. And, and then those projects, they happen within a landscape and within an ecosystem. And that landscape and ecosystem needs to be considered when, when planning that project, which activities to implement, what type of restoration to do. It's key that um, both the, the nature and people within that landscape and ecosystem are, are considered and then we need um, those those projects and um, and uh, restoration activities and to monitor at a larger scale at a uh, subnational or national scale we need interoperability um, so we need um, a, a flexible flame framework because we can't have we can't use the same uh, kind of indicators to monitor all restoration uh, in, in at least speaking for the UN decade um, we and um, and for the global biodiversity framework we're talking about all ecosystems so often people think about planting trees as restoration but it's not it's not only trees it's an it's an important component um, but there's also restoration of grasslands, there's restoration of wetlands, of peatlands, of oceans, of rivers. Um, so we have terrestrial, aquatic, transitional landscapes. And, um, and then at the, at the national scale, we, we need a, a flexible and interoperable framework that can put all of this data together, um, as, as we heard, um, we, collaboration, cross-sectoral collaboration at the, at the national scale, and and then globally, we hope that um, through the the um, biodiversity framework, um, which is to restore 30% of uh, degraded areas by 2030, that we can have then a. a global perspective uh, from countries 
on, on how we're doing, but it, it starts at the project scale. Yeah, for me, um, there's, there's one thought that I sometimes uh, think about. So, for example, as an implementer on the ground, uh, um, an important question that we always get from funders is like, how do you make sure that there's no double counting of seedlings, for example? A very obvious question. Um, but then I would, I normally respond like, how do you make sure that internationally there's no double counting of areas? And I think there's no global database, at least I, I'm not aware of it where a project implementer can integrate their, their shape files, their delineation of the areas. Because basically what could be happening, I hope it doesn't, but like that you implement a project one time for four different people and then you would get the money four times. And I think this is actually um, a, a problem that nobody seems to really care about or at least, I don't know, maybe, I mean, everybody's positive what I like, that, that nobody assumes that this might happen, but um, I. I see this as a potential problem that should be addressed and which really um, integrates into this, this approach like we have to scale it from the bottom to worldwide and we should be able to communicate within all those different platforms and I mean we're, we're at fault as well because we created our own as well. So, um, but there should be some, some standard to share all this data at least to, yeah, to, to be then able to verify it as well. Uh, for me, I think uh, we need to first to put people in the center of everything we are doing because at uh, the end of the day, that's we are doing restoration for them. That's a common. Once we have uh, involvement and buying of everyone involved, uh, things we started uh, fitting itself. So, but I will add more a couple of things like standardization of and monitoring protocols because. Uh, when you're trying to do monitoring, there is many, many approaches we can do. And we need at least to, to have common understanding and agree on the principle to, to follow. Another one is data sharing and collaboration. Because, and we have been talking about it, and this also, some people, like um, previous speakers mentioned, you are spending a lot of money in data collection, and yet another organization has done so. So in, instead of collaboration and data sharing, this becomes consuming a lot of your budget, yet you could have used uh, next door to your, to your neighbor who has data and can give you. Another one I might uh, emphasize on integration of remote sensing and geospatial because this uh, best practice and this has um, proven to be a source of good information and to, to be um, working toward to restoration efforts. Thank you. Yeah, a lot has been said already, but just one point that we should all keep in mind is that when we work at developing global models to uh, try to get a more cost-effective way to monitor what's going on on the ground, we should also think of going back to the project level insight and landscape level insight to ground truth these global model, uh, models and, and really make it efficient at every scale. Um, just very short, though, at the, the, um, the farmers, you know, w w if, you, if you're a farmer that wants to do things right and you plant trees to preserve water sources or something, the, the question is what is the incentive for that farmer to report those trees to somebody else, no? Because if not, you know, there is a lot of talk about participatory monitoring. But reality is that the, the, what is the incentive for me if I am doing that uh, to that? And I think one of the things we are working with Costa Rica, which is an example of that, is uh, trying to provide probably a tax relief. So if you are doing the right thing and you report that to me, then I will give you something back and then they can capture that. Because what happened is that uh, everything that doesn't pass through government's programs is invisible more or less to, to them, no? Yeah. That was really, really great. I um, yeah, really like the always bringing people to the centre of the equation and uh, really focusing on capacity development. And uh, I think in restoration, people are at the centre of it. It's, it's quite different to reducing deforestation because people are intrinsically involved in restoration, right? And they, they need to be involved in the data collection, ideally. 
So the year, there's a lot of great questions that actually build on, on the discussion. One that I wanted to pick up, and maybe I, I, I asked for volunteers from the panel. So we know that the monitoring is expensive and difficult. I mean, what we saw is we saw some incredible examples of using technological innovation to monitor things. What sort of, what would be your advice for, for like a project to have key indicators? Like, and I know, that, I know that we've actually seen some presentations to help people do that, right? But to, I'd, love to, I'd love to help, if you could help me answer this question. How, how, what advice should we be giving to a project developer just in terms of what key indicators they need to, to monitor their restoration efforts? Maybe there's no answer. Maybe we sh they should go through Aurora, or they should, but please, open the floor. Well, yeah, there's the, the indicators in, in at least, it depends on the objective, no? If you want to biomass, then the indicator has to be trees or carbon. If it's water, then it has to be associated to that. So pretty much the indicator depends on, on what you want to achieve in terms of uh, multiple goals that Yelena was talking about, restoration, that is multiple. What about the... Um hard and expensive. It is hard ex and expensive, but from the experience of Wells for Soy, it really also pays out because um, if you don't do it, nobody trusts you, and why should you give money to somebody that you don't trust? Like, who, who would do that? And, and so if you do it, or if you at least try to do it right or, in, or increase the quality of it, then p you, you, you get the trust and people approach you even. Um, yeah, I think, and you know, maybe a way to flip the question a little bit, because of course that's um, that's what a lot of people are looking for, right? Guidance on how to do this like very simply and efficiently. I mean, I think it is um, just as my colleagues here have said, it's very complicated, and it depends what your goals are and where you're operating and what the um, nature of the restoration project is. It's actually it's it's quite complicated because it just is complicated. Um, I mean, I think there are a couple of things that, um, of, you know, a number of us on the panel have been working on to try to assist in this area. One thing that the GROW Network developed was a restoration uh, monitoring information sharing framework, which is not simple, and it's not few indicators, but it's a framework that provides kind of a menu of indicators that is meant to be pretty comprehensive, actually. Um, I, I see we have a question from Slido on biodiversity. So, you know, it includes biodiversity, but a lot of other aspects. And I mean, I think one, the, the part of the question around expense is, you know, we, we need to also sort of push that onto the, the funders and the donors and push for an acknowledgement that this needs to be planned from the outset, as someone else said, right? This needs to be, um, we need, donors and funders to be setting an expectation that monitoring will be part of a project design and that it will be included in the cost of the restoration work so that it can be properly um, built into the effort. That's wonderful. I think we have a, I think we've tackled most of the questions. There's a lot of very specific questions there, but we'll, we'll leave them. But uh, we have an incredible audience here and I know some people here uh, have restoration platforms, and I'd, I'd love to. I'd love to open the floor to the to people in the room to to compliment, to maybe bring your experience from from your platform, your experience of of having a restoration project. So, yeah, I invite anybody from the room to um to ask us a question. Um, please come. Oh, oh, here comes the microphone. Please. Thank you very much, and uh, my name is Clement. Uh, I work for the African Union Development Agency. I would like to appreciate uh, the panel. Uh, those are very, very thoughtful, and uh, the insight is great. I just want to share some thoughts on the subject of data collection monitoring and some of the challenges and the opportunities that we should explore. Uh, there is a lot of data, uh, as we hear, and there is a lot of tools. Uh, we have this huge cake. It's so big. It's enough for everyone. 
but how we share the cake, how we partake in it eating, uh, is where we should uh, probably focus attention on the coordination. It's not about the numbers. It's not going to be possible for us to even set a standard. So I'm very pleased to see the discussion uh, focuses a lot on the framework and the interoperability that is required. Now, that said, uh, when we look at uh, what is happening on the ground, restoration doesn't happen in the air. It has to, it, it happens on the ground. Uh, there is a chicken and egg situation in my view uh, that uh, one, on one hand, we must uh, monitor to bring in more uh, resources or investment uh, to scale up restoration, uh, and that is a requirement. On the other hand as well, who pays for that? We hear the, the cost of restoration. Who is willing to pay for this restoration before it clouds in uh, monitoring, for it to cloud in uh, more money or more resources? The answer has not been very clear to me, uh, at least. Uh, who, who should be paying for it and, and, and who must pay for it, uh, the cost of that? Uh, there is a lot of data that is being collected. The question I, put, I challenge all of us here, the issue of lack of coordination on the ground level, as well as the data subject, how we treat this data subject, where we, those that we are collecting the data from, the trust issues that are coming up here. What are we doing to address those? I don't have a silver bullet answer. I work at the policy level, but these are the issues we have, the data governance, the ethical issues, why we are not having access to data when we need it. I would like to hear more reflection on those few remarks I've made. I think you summarized the situation beautifully. We, we have a cake, right? <laughs> I think uh, I, it it's uh, has many layers, this cake, right? And, uh, and I think if you, if you just look at the cake, it looks a bit confusing. But I feel like we're, we're talking, and, and through the monitoring task force, we, we, we try and bring some coordination, because there's a lot of excitement. There's a lot of people driving technology and innovation. I think we should encourage that. But we should always try and, um, yeah, try and coordinate our efforts to, to, re to reduce duplication of effort. I am... Um, you also brought up an, a very important point on um, equality, and I think that comes back to capacity development. You know, we really need to, and at this conference, actually, I've heard some incredible technological presentations, but I'm always thinking we, need, we really need to focus on getting that into the hands of the people, right, that make decisions at different scales. I think that's a gap that I've seen um, so far that we, we need to refocus on. But I'd love to pass to the, to the panel to reflect on Clement's uh, Excellent question, please. Yeah, thank you, Clement. Um, yeah, great, great questions. Lots of food for thought there. Um, I'd like to hit on or try to um, provide some thoughts on the um, question you asked about uh, kind of transparency and trust. Um, and I think, well, one, it's important to know where restoration is happening, and that's not always easy to um, to have. And as uh, as Kevin mentioned, you might have someone that's claiming, in, and maybe theoretically, um, restoration in the same area. So I think it's um, there. There are many efforts to, to collect. Um, information on the locations of restoration and knowing where it's happening uh, provides a level of accountability uh, to the restoration project. And I think, um, and what we're trying to do is have some interoperability and so we can see if uh, then with that spatial data it would be very easy to see then if uh, these platforms are talking together, um, if there is duplication 
Um, and if there's duplication also in terms of multiple aspects, not only the place, but when that restoration was happening, what type of activities are being implemented, what kind of um, objectives they have, what kind of ecosystem they're um, targeting. Um, and then I think that can help uh, build trust, uh, transparency, and accountability in restoration, monitoring, and reporting. And, and to build on that, maybe just giving an example on how we decided to address that question of trust uh, for the Landscale tool. Um, I talked about the validation process, and the validation process involves local experts from the landscape. Um, and I think that's really key uh, in addition to transparency to really building that trust. And on the chicken and egg uh, situation, it is actually uh, a problem. So what we need to address that is a cultural shift among the donor community and among the project implementers uh, community so that when, um, when people request funding, for a restoration project for the first time, there, is, there are some actions planned for the monitoring and there is a budget associated to that and that is welcomed by the, the, the donor or investors investing in that. I think that's what we really need. Any other final reflections? Or a question, please. Um, yeah, we'll bring the microphone. Well, I just have a reflection. I'm, my name is Peter Pellikka from University of Helsinki, and nice to see you, Jelena, there in the panel. She used to be in Helsinki like 10 years ago. Uh, <clears throat> I'm leading research in Kenya, running title research station, and there's discussion about uh, uh, planting trees in the areas which lost their trees due to fire and, and people's activities. It's in the highland areas, in the mountains, and people speak about carbon stocks, so that it would be the main reason to plant trees. Well, it's really a reason, but we very often we forgot the multiple benefits of the forests, like uh, water harvesting, habitats for biodiversity, and also livelihoods of the people, and also ecotourism. I just would like to remind that uh, we, we really cannot focus on one simple topic like carbon sequestration and carbon stocks also have to remember all the multiple benefits what forests are having. So I come from Finland, so we are land of forests, even though our carbon stocks are decreasing. I'm not really worried about that. Just a reflection from your talks. Thank you. That's a great reminder. I think, um, I think restoration is quite unique because it's, um, it has multiple benefits, right? And it has the socioeconomic and the biophysical outcomes. A biophysically beyond carbon, there's biodiversity, there's many positive outcomes. We, we're almost out of time, and it's been a really rich discussion. Is there any final, um, final interventions from the crowd? Or, um, should we, uh, we we're kind of, should wrap up, I think? Yeah, okay. So that was, um, that was really remarkable. I think uh, we have a big challenge in front of us. I, um, you know, we have, um, we have a, lot of, uh, a lot of commitments uh, for restoration. Uh, yeah, this, an area the size of China um, has been committed by governments around the world to, to restore. And, uh, and we, now we have the lighthouse, we have the CBD 30% uh, res restoration by, by 2030, and we have movement at all scales, which is really unique to restoration, from very local level action to landscape to, to government level to regional level, things like the Great Green Wall, and then to international level. So yeah, I think the real, the real challenge came up nicely. Um, we, need to, we need to talk continuously at this moment. There's so much innovation and there's, there's really exciting platforms and I think we need to encourage all this innovation. We need to, although we may end up with a cake that, that looks uh, complicated, uh, we want people to be able to monitor and report their restoration efforts in the way they would like to do it. So if they want to use a different platform, we fully encourage that. But really the key that we heard several times is, is really the need to keep talking to each other and make sure that at some point we're interoperable. I think only then can we, can we tackle issues like uh, double counting, right? 
if we if we are able to come up with uh, and it's it's not easy but to come up with a with an area-based estimate of, of restoration uh, nationally and globally and then have that report progress against the the CBD target too it would be a remarkable achievement um, and we will try and work toward that so um, thank you very much I know there were many people online so thank you for joining us there's a number of booths where participants will be so please go to the is it the marketplace please go to the marketplace we I will we have a booth as well and I think many of the partners that have uh, working on restoration monitoring have a booth so that'd be a great moment to um, to continue the discussion and um, yeah thank you very much to the panelists and, and a great audience thank you very much oh and thank you Katie who organized the entire event Woo!